It's August 22nd, 1953, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. Today in history in 1953, the last inmates were finally returned home to their native France after the closure of what had long been regarded as the most brutal, feared and horrific penal colony in the world, Devil's Island in French Guiana. And how many prisoners were returned on this final voyage? The fittingly diabolical sum of precisely 666 sorry souls. Yeah, I mean, Devil's Island is an evocative enough name (sighs) itself, but uh, this penal colony was also known as the Green Hell Mm. and the Dry Guillotine, uh, which was the name it was given by René Belbenoit's book, Dry Guillotine. Now, he was an ex-prisoner of the colony, sentenced in 1921 to eight years of hard labour for a series of thefts. 14 years later, after several escape attempts, he turns up in Los Angeles, emaciated, toothless, and publishes this memoir of his time there, which was so sensational and so upsetting to the French people that this colony existed where essentially people, some of whom were sentenced for theft or political offences, were effectively being sentenced to death, that the French government decided to close Devil's Island. But then World War II happened, so 15 years went by until this date when finally the final prisoners were sent home. And Devil's Island is often used to refer to the whole French Guiana penal colony system. And actually, of all of the different prison camps, Devil's Island itself was probably the best part to be in. (laughs) I know it doesn't sound like it, guys. People forget the Titanic was a really great cruise until it hit the iceberg. Uh, Let me sell you on your imprisonment in Devil's Island by putting it in context. It's one of the Salvation Islands, which is an uninhabited trio of small islands a few miles off the Guianan coast. And it was the Alcatraz of South America. It had high cliffs, very rough and shark infested seas it's so difficult to access there was a cable car to connect it to the neighboring Il Royale so that guards and supplies could be transported without risking death but there were never more than 12 prisoners on Devil's Island itself and each prisoner had their own stone hut they had slightly better food than inmates on the mainland and crucially they were spared from the prisoner on prisoner violence which was one of the worst parts of the whole penal colony experience was that you had all of these people they're basically thrown into barracks together fighting one another the guards were whipping them and beating them they were doing awful forced labor which that wasn't actually happening on devil's island the vast majority of prisoners would end up either in the main camp at saint laurent de maroni doing brutal manual labor or in these remote jungle camps where they were logging cutting sugarcane or hacking out roads through remote jungle that actually most of the didn't serve a purpose. Yeah, I mean, you can see that this was probably not the worst place in the world by the fact that French settlers actually arrived in French Guiana in the 1760s and being kind of decimated at the time by yellow fever, sought refuge on this trio of islands eight miles off the shore from the mainland. And it's funny how you can ruin a paradise by making it a terrible, terrible place to be. But French Emperor Napoleon III was seeking to solve several problems simultaneously with Devil's Island. First, he wanted to get rid of anyone who had opposed his December 1851 coup, uh, and he sent these prisoners uh, just after seizing power, uh, a total of 239 Republicans who had resisted his power grab. Second, setting up this colony would remove all of these dangerous criminals from the country that they didn't know what to do with otherwise. And third, the convicts were sent to jumpstart the lagging colonisation of French Guiana in the first place. So it had a kind of, you know, multiple benefit function the way that the establishment of the colony in Australia uh, was to the British. Well, whilst you're both being so positive about all the benefits of having Devil's Island, (laughs) I would again return to my comment that it was essentially a death sentence for the vast majority of people that ever went there. In its 99-year existence as a penal colony, an estimated 70,000 criminals were sent and only 2,000 returned. And that's because of the hard physical labour that we discussed. It's because of the rampant yellow fever and dysentery that was there. And it's because the journey to get there from France to French Guiana, Mm. just that in itself. I mean, prisoners were put in cages. When they started fighting each other, pipes sent out jets of scalding hot steam. This is on the boat to try and control their tempers. And even when you'd served your sentence, you were then released, 
into French Guiana, not back to France, <laughs> where a lot of the factors that were life limiting continued to impact on your life. Hooray, I'm free. Boo, yellow fever. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, you can see that the French government were trying to do something like what the British were doing in Australia, where well behaved convicts could get a ticket of leave, which let them live outside the penal colony and work as long as they stayed in an allotted area and didn't do anything else. And then they would finally be properly free once their term was over. And so what the French did with the Devil's Island penal colony system was that sentences of less than eight years were subject to what they called doublage, which means doubling. That meant you served your term in the penal colony and then an additional mandatory term of the same length as a, you know, quote unquote, free settler in French Guiana before you would have the possibility of returning to France. Anything over eight years, you were exiled for life. The issue was that in Guiana, it just didn't work. Life was just too harsh. You know, the former inmates either died or returned to crime just to stay alive. You know, the, we've touched on the disease. There was also the climate. It was very extreme. Wild animals, poor diet, and just a lack of infrastructure in comparison to what was happening in Australia just didn't really make it sustainable for these very broken, scarred, traumatised men to start anything resembling a, a life as a free settler. And also, if you had a fight with a prison guard... You know, where's the trial and the due process when you're stuck mm. out on an island? It was the guillotine for you. I mean, a load of them got executed once they got there. Yeah, they would bring the prisoners in and they would be forced to kneel and watch the person being executed. So it really was like this kind of brutal little world of its own. And then their heads were pickled in alcohol and sent back to Paris as proof that the execution wow. had happened. Imagine having to identify that person. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Louis Rousseau, who was the chief prison doctor there in the 1920s, estimated the average lifespan of an inmate to be five years. You know, the tide of public opinion had shifted so much as to what the purpose of incarceration was. I mean, at the time in the 1850s, when they started sending people out there, it was seen as being not a humane alternative, but at the very least a more convenient alternative to the practice at the time, which was to keep prisoners on what were called hulks, you know, giant ships where they were all hanging up in chains. And it was actually the fact that they were blocking ports and inconveniencing dock workers that <laughs> led to the idea that we need to send these people further away. But by the 20th century, the idea had very much shifted to, you know, prisons should be reforming the inmates rather than just breaking them and working them to death under the hot sun. And so a place like Devil's Island, where there was literally what was called the Crimson Barracks, where they housed the worst inmates, so called for its copious bloodshed as they laid into one another, mm. was no longer seen as being, you know, the forefront of a modern penal system. God, speaking of bloodshed, one of the things that prison officials used to do apparently was toss the corpses of dead prisoners just into the waters around the islands, ringing a bell that alerted the sharks to swarm and feast, which is like the sickest form of the Pavlov's dog experiment <laughs> that I can imagine. But I think the French attitude to the prison was also massively impacted by the story of Henri Charrier, who was one of the most famous prisoners to be sent there in the first place. He was a Parisian gangster who was sent to Devil's Island in 1931. And he maintained his innocence throughout the whole time he was there. He was convicted of murdering a pimp and sentenced to life in prison on Devil's Island, but he started plotting his escape as soon as he arrived and he did these multiple attempts to get off, usually getting quite far into the process of escape before he was then sort of swept up by the authorities and taken back in. But he tried eight times altogether. Others you might think would have given up by this stage, but on his eighth attempt, he managed to actually escape by building a raft out of coconuts, navigating through these shark-infested waters to Venezuela, and from there he wrote this explosive book entitled Papillon, which was his gangster's name, about his time there. And that has certainly kind of crystallised people's image of what went on. You can also see why the French wouldn't be that keen to revisit all of the things that he was alleging, because partly through the publication of Papillon and the Hollywood films that have been made of it since, they're embarrassed by this. Mm. This is a sort of national humiliation. I mean, as you say, Arian, there is some correlation with what Britain was doing in Australia, but this is decades afterwards. Mm. 1953. This closed after the war. <laughs> and I think you can see that in the very limited tourism that is allowed to Devil's Island. You know, this is not Alcatraz. You cannot go and have a selfie uh, where Papillon was. You can basically bundle a fisherman $100 to take you across and have a look. <laughs> there is actually one hotel on Ile Royale, which used to be the prison director's house. But according to the TripAdvisor reviews that I read, it still seems to attract complaints like it has poor soundproofing, no Wi-Fi and few vegetarian options. I mean, will the <laughs> suffering never end? <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> 
most countries also then happened to voluntarily <laughs> join the Federation of Soviet Republics. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors.